solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as the trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. So, Dheer, uh, congratulations on the book. Hey, thanks, DJ. The CEO Factory, and uh, thanks for making time for the Play to Potential podcast. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, before we dive into the book, Sudhir, uh, you share some stunning statistics. Yeah. Uh, that uh, you talk about over a 60 year period where uh, the economy multiplied 1400x, yeah. but HUL earnings multiplied 6000x. Yeah. Before we uh, study HUL's, uh, let's say, secret sauce. Yeah. Uh, give us a sense of why we should study it. Give us a significance of the journey. Yeah. Now, HUL DJ is quite a remarkable company. You know, one of there are many remarkable statistics about HUL. One of them, which a lot of people find fascinating, is nine out of ten Indians, which is close to 1.15 or 1.2 billion Indians, use an HUL product every month. That's more than forget Google or Facebook. It's more than electricity. It's more than voting. It's more than people have access to roads. So there is very, very few things in India which will unify people as much as their, you know, usage of an HUL product, which is a kind of a, you know, always worth remembering. But the other really interesting thing about HUL is a very old company. You know, in 19, it, it was really formed 125 years ago, but in its current form in 1958. And when I looked at the annual report of HUL in 1958, uh, you know, I saw that our profits were a crore. In the period of uh, 60 years, uh, the company has grown 6,000 times, which is a 15% earning CAGR over six decades. Now, lots of companies have spectacular 10-year records of you know, doubling, trebling, et cetera, but it's very hard to consistently grow earnings 15%. So, you know, in terms of the financial performance, and you know, in 19, uh, in the late 50s when it was formed, it was a top five company in India. In 1986, when the Sensex was formed, it was the fourth largest company in terms of market cap. And today it's the fourth largest company in terms of market cap. So maybe with the exception of General Electric, uh, there are very few companies that have been top of the game for a 60 year period, which actually counts for a, a lot. Uh, it kind of means that the, you know, the vicissitudes of various external changes, notwithstanding this kind of company has motored on. And then there are other remarkable statistics about HUL. You know, it's well known as a CEO factory. Last when we counted, we were able to count 400 CEOs or CXOs who are from Unilever. Over the last decade, AC Nielsen has a dream employer of the year in the top 20 MBA schools. And I think in eight of those 10 years, HUL has been number one. Even in the last, you know, for example, the return on capital invested, which is a really good measure of how efficient a company is, HUL has close to 100% ROC. Uh, you know, the, even the CPG averages, and CPG already returns capital very well, is in the 30s. So whether you look at long-term metrics, short-term metrics, sort of consumer metrics, human metrics, and then there's this qualitative thing about, because HUL has been around so long, the HUL style of management has permeated many companies in India. So, you know, you may not know it, but there are parts, you know, I discovered, I was telling you when I was working with my publisher that, Many parts of HUL are there in many parts of corporate India. So I guess that's the, that's why I think it's a sort of important company worth being studied. Lovely. And when you say 400, is it Unilever or HUL? HUL. Wow. HUL. Oh, that's a stunning statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, in my past life as a search consultant, uh, yeah. I guess I was, uh, I did some of those uh, placements as well. But I want to take you back in time, Sudhir, uh, close to two decades back uh, when we were in IMA and you referred to Professor uh, A.K. Jain and the book and we were in the same section and we, uh, we witnessed some of his uh, marketing genius. You speak about uh, getting the problem right, yeah. problem definition yeah. right. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you mean by that in the context of business and marketing. Yeah. But uh, maybe if you could also reflect a little bit on how you've applied that in your journey. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, uh, DJ, the HUL and IMA firstly have a very, very, and I realized this only when I was researching the book, a very, very deep relationship. So PL Tandon, who was our first Indian chairman, was one of the founders along with uh, Ravi Mathai of IMA. So he was right up there. And the person who is sort of credited along with Professor A.K. Jain of building the marketing faculty in IIM Ahmedabad is Labdi Bandari, who a lot of people, you know, he uh, he was an HUL brand manager. So in marketing, in some ways, the IMA way of thinking and the HUL way of thinking 
you know, as I've realized, having been to both are kind of very similar. And at the heart of it is problem definition. You know, it's always, it's always more difficult to define a problem than to solve it. And you know, you can always get people to solve problems. And a lot of our time in our education, a lot of us try and focus on being problem solvers. But the difficult thing is to, you know, as Professor Jain used to say, what is the problem? And, 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 and I guess that's the big learning. If you, if you ask me that what's the big learning in marketing is, you got to keep asking that question, what's the problem? And I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, when I was in ice creams, where I actually, you know, despite sort of saying this all the time, I failed myself. And, you know, I was, I just joined the ice cream business five, six years ago, and I was going to Bombay markets, and I found they were small. And I asked people, why don't you keep an ice cream cabinet? And they said, because there's no space. Uh, so I said, look, you know, let's go and design a small ice cream cabinet. So we designed this small miniature ice cream cabinet, which we thought was the solution to Bombay outlets. But as we started placing them, we realized that the, it was it was one third the capacity, but it was two thirds the electricity consumption of the regular cabinet. So while it made sense in terms of real estate, it didn't really make sense in terms of uh, the overall economics. So the question I should have asked at that time is, how do I make ice creams profitable for the retailer, not how do I get a cabinet into the retailer? And had I asked that question, I wouldn't have spent the kind of money and uh, had the fiasco that we had with uh, the Chotu cabinets. Very interesting. And back to your journey, Sudhir, uh, in, in the context of how you frame your choices, have you, have you sort of uh, found this clarifying in terms of the question you ask leading to uh, a different way of looking at a situation? I don't know, uh, Deepak. I certainly do a lot of it, and I certainly am very conscious about it, and especially when I'm confused. See, very often, uh, decision-making, and we can talk about it later, is actually the crucial secret sauce of, uh, of management, and one of the key things that Levers teaches you, and, and a good decision uh, you know, has to be both intuitive and rational. And often, when you find these in conflict, that's the right time for you to take a step back and say, what is the problem? What is the real decision I'm making? So when, when the heart and the mind don't uh, are not in tango for a decision, that's when you know that you've not really clarified the problem. So that's the way I look at it. Now, the reason I ask is in the context of the work I do, sometimes I tell leaders, you know, who are in transition, what are you solving for? Yeah. Are you solving for impact? Yeah. Are you solving for harmony across domains of life, yeah. or are you solving for something else? And that determines choices. Right. That's right. So till you have that clarity around what you're solving for. I'm saying to raise the question, but you know, all of us, and you know, you, you, it's a very, very hard thing, and it's not an obvious uh, answer on what the problem is. In fact, that's the hard work. And once that is answered, then everything is quite easy after that. True. And back to your journey, Sudhir, uh, we spoke about this sometime back as well. You've been in HUL for two decades. And when we did the inventory uh, from our batch, uh, maybe you and a couple of others have been in the same institution uh, for that long, and they, all the others have moved on. Uh, how have you thought about staying on in HUL? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there, there were moments in time where you got those calls yeah. uh, about opportunities elsewhere. Yeah. Give us a sense of, uh, you know, what is it about institutions like HUL, yeah. which uh, give you an opportunity to pursue a 20-year career and beyond. Yeah. And also tell us a little bit about uh, how you've thought about some of those moments in time yeah. where you could have possibly branched off? I think uh, HUL is among the few organizations that do tend to have a lot of people staying on for a lot of time. <laughs> and if a lot of people stay on for a lot of time, notwithstanding some of the daily sort of irritations of every job, it means broadly you're happy. I mean, that's broad. I think HUL does a few things right. I think uh, it has excellent HR processes, I would say. It has excellent training processes early on in your career. And it has excellent career management uh, and ca career development where you're learning throughout. So you're kind of constantly building on yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons that this uh, really strong, uh, and, and there are some, you know, you, one can say that, you know, careers are structured, it's a bit slower, et cetera, et cetera. But broadly, I, I would say this HR system, when you take a step back, is outstanding. As a consequence of this HR system, I think there's a lot of camaraderie among the people. So you kind of work with friends, so you enjoy coming to work. Uh, there is also a lot of very bright people here, so you, that is also something you like. And there are shared experiences, you know, early experiences in HUL. One of the differentiating factors in HUL versus any company in the world, actually, there are very few which give such a tough early experience uh, when you're just a sort of greenhorn out of a business school and, you know, you think you know it all. And those shared experiences also kind of form a bonding. And 
and I suspect finally the values of the company are uh, are of very very high quality. So you go to sleep uh, feeling good about yourself. I guess these are the in, in in general terms these are the reason why it's not just me. It's a lot of people uh, uh, who last for uh, uh, long periods of time. Uh, I mean there haven't been that many moments where I've thought about leaving. Once or twice I have, and I guess the reason that I've never left is. They were always rational reasons to leave, never emotional reasons to leave. So emotionally, I was always happy and fulfilled and so on and so forth. Somebody might have come with a salary which was higher or a job which seemed like a higher, uh, you know, status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so the rational mind works, but it's again going back to a decision. The, the heart and the mind have to sink, and for me anyway, they haven't sunk. They haven't been in sync yet. And and the other reason I ask is. Uh, in an organization as large as HUL, sometimes you could get opportunities where it's a smaller company, but it's a CEO role. Yeah. And yeah. leaders sometimes struggle to think about, you know, business head in a large company yeah. versus the company head of a smaller company. Yeah. So yeah. how do you think about that? You know, DJ, again, to be honest, this is a, it's a slightly rational question, right? Which is, I guess you just have to feel it at some point. You got to feel at some point that, you know, this game is up here or you got to move on. Uh, and, and, and it need not be for a CEO of a smaller company. It could well be for a business head of a big company. So, uh, so I, I, I just feel that, uh, you, that that has to click. And maybe, you know, in, in conversation with you in the past as well, uh, transition moments, you know, they have to work here and they have to click. So. And picking up on the point around HR, Sudhir, uh, one of the things you talk about in the book is that HR uh, here has teeth. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing you say. Yeah. And the other thing that I found interesting was uh, back to the point around shared experiences. Yeah. You say that the first 10 to 12 years in HUL are uh, are uh, like an IAS or a government services yeah. kind of a tenure based yeah. uh, career plan after which high potentials take off and yeah. you know there's an opportunity to differentiate yourself. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about both these. One is about uh, what do you mean by HR has teeth? Yeah. Uh, and second is uh, why why is it that uh, you know, HUL has a sort of interesting approach of 10 to 12 years of predictable career path yeah. and then uh, variability. HR in HUL does indeed have teeth and I think there are two or three reasons. Uh, it's an independent function in HUL. Uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of the HR managers have had the same shared experiences that business folks have had. They've gone through the same management trainee. Their first stint is also in a factory or in a sales branch. So they kind of have seen through the same uh, shared experiences while being an independent function. We've also historically and at a very early stage had HR as an independent function from business. Many companies in the past would have someone who was a technical person or a supply chain person kind of becoming the HR head, not so much anymore. But HUL very early on had uh, independent HR functions and independent HR professionals. So HR has also been one of the functions which HUL has really developed in a, in a sort of professional sense in India. So this you know high quality independent HR guys uh, and then an HR system which is deeply embedded in the business so independent on one hand, but close to the business on one hand, has kind of meant that we've had a, a strong HR system that shows the mirror to organizations. I think that's what HR has to do. It doesn't always happen, but most often or very often it does. And give us a sense of how it plays out when you say show the mirror, make it real for us. I'm saying, for example, you know, I can't just recruit someone to be a subordinate in my team heading a large business. It doesn't work like that, you know. Uh, ultimately, I'm the final decision maker on people who have to be recruited who report to me, but there is, a, there is a strong process. There will be a process where HR will bring out CVs of all the candidates. HR will have a strong view. They will insist I interview. They, you know, most often an HR person will sit in the interview and they can disagree with me on paper. And if they really strongly disagree, they escalate it. So while I have a, a sort of nodal function in recruiting my own team, I don't have unfettered freedom, and I think that's the right thing. I don't think uh, in professional organizations, uh, you know, people should have unfettered freedom. Hmm. And back to your point about, uh, you know, so, uh, sometimes the one line of thinking could be people with technical background who have a people orientation yeah. could do well in HR yeah. because it sort of gives them a sense of how business is done. Yeah. So when you say people in HR, uh, of course, they go through the stint, so they yeah. build an appreciation of yeah. business. How do you see the trade-off here? Uh, I mean, I, I don't have a definitive answer for this, and I'm sure some there are experts who view it, but I personally feel uh, with the experience of HUL that HR, like marketing or, you know, is not just a flare. You know, somebody has an HR flare, so you move them. 
it is a discipline. You know, you have to learn it. You have to go through IR relations. You have to see a branch. You have to business partner someone. You have to work in rewards. So, you know, the, you've got to see the full rotation. You, yes, it's very good to have a people sort of flair, like people have a marketing flair, but I think it's a lot more than that. So I would personally, and I, I guess the jury is out, but I would personally put my uh, sort of money behind uh, an HR function. I hear you. And back to your point about the, the career uh, path, sort of the 10 to 12 years of, let's say, steady pace, after which there's acceleration and deceleration. What's the, uh, what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting thinking. A lot of uh, youngsters uh, sometimes get frustrated with it in HUL. They see their peers early on doing better, you know, going to, uh, to Europe, traveling business class, whereas they're in some market in some remote corner of India. And even salaries, uh, they move uh, gradually in HUL. So, uh, so, so, so there is always this sort of feeling that, you know, is this meritocratic? Why is everyone uh, getting the same output? I, I think it's actually strongly meritocratic. I think one of the strengths of HUL, and I guess the market recognizes it's strongly meritocratic, I think we just don't judge too early. I think there's a full 10 years uh, in which is almost like a extended training. Of course, you have your uh, appraisals and of course, people are valuing you from a very early age for potential. It's not that you're not being valued even for potential at an early age and so on and so forth. But the thinking is that you do the, you know, let's take sales and marketing, which is the function that I'm in. You do three, you know, do a stint in sales, you do a stint in operational marketing, you do a stint in strategic marketing, which is a roughly eight, 10 year uh, sort of thing. And then you're fully groomed to, to kind of go to the next level. And that's really when serious uh, differentiation comes in. I think it prevents, uh, and I think it's a it's a big thing. You know, you should not create heroes too soon, especially in junior management. You know, results are impacted by many external factors. Of course, you, uh, and it's not easy to differentiate. And even if it's you, you know, people should get the time. So, building heroes and villains too fast uh, is probably not the right thing. And 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 and, and I think the HUL. A batch system of uh, having batch parity for a reasonable period of time, roughly. And it's not that we have exact batch parity that everybody gets promoted the same day and all. There is differentiation and there is, of course, flexibility. But broadly looking at it as sort of time bound for a period of time and then really sort of accelerating or not, uh, I would say is, uh, is, is a prudent way of doing it. And back to, let's say, uh, let's say talent retention yeah. uh, as, a, as a challenge. During the 10, 12 year phase when, you know, your peers are taking off yeah. and you're sort of chugging along at a, at a sort of a seemingly slow pace, what do you do to ensure that these people don't uh, leave for the wrong reason and they see that, take that long term view? What, what, how do you approach that? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, uh, then here's the paradox, which is why you're probably doing the right thing, right? I mean, you don't give the acceleration of 10 years, but you still have very high retentions and you still have people uh, going on for a long time. I think the uh, environment, the, the camaraderie and the sort of learning environment and a collegial environment, you see the campus here is a, it's almost like a college. Uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing, and I'll tell you what's the negative of it. But HUL then forms a universe for you in the first 10, 12 years. That's the advantage of it. So you're living in the universe, you're judging yourself versus this, and it's a big enough universe to kind of live in it, uh, if you can call it a bubble if you want, but it's, it's, a, it's a universe in itself. The con of it is that after a certain age, we've got to be really aware in HUL that we're not too inward looking and that there is a wide big world outside HUL. And that could be a, a sort of con of the HUL way of management uh, if one doesn't sort of take care of it and is not conscious of it. Hmm. When you say inward looking, in what sense? Uh... For the same reason, it's a large uh, self-sufficient universe. You can have a lot of your friends from HUL. Your social life is HUL. You know, your conversations, you have so many categories within HUL that, you know, ice cream is very, very far from LACME. So you can go and spend some time with the LACME guys and learn about uh, cosmetics. So there's enough learning in this uh, in this world. So, so, so that's why it can, uh, if you're not careful, become a little inward look. Understood. Uh, the other term you use in the book, Sudhir, which I found interesting was the uh, notion of entrepreneur professionals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in a way, most professional organizations are struggling with this issue. Yeah. How do you drive entrepreneurship? And yeah. several entrepreneurs are struggling with it too, yeah. in terms of how do you bring professional uh, behavior yeah. while retaining entrepreneurship. So talk to us about what you mean by this term. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a little bit around how HUL thinks about fostering this behavior. Yeah. So this is a term, you know, I asked uh, several CEOs of uh, several companies, you know, what, what is it in HUL that 
uh, makes so many of you CEOs. So I asked Gopal Vittal this, who is the CEO of Airtel, and he gave me two or three, but the word that he used was entrepreneur professional. A professional is relatively easy for a multinational to understand, right? Professional means that you follow the process, you follow the rule. That is the etymology of professional. I think the entrepreneurship is a, is a relatively uh, rarer quality. Uh, and I was thinking about what is it in HUL that makes uh, people entrepreneur. Uh, I think there are a couple of them. One is we get high quality people who are driven to succeed and output oriented. And they're not just people who want to bide their time in the organization. So they want to push. I mean, by nature, uh, that's the, and you know, culture reinforces itself. So you're always having people pushing, saying, how do I grow faster and how do I so on and so forth. I think the second thing is a lot of us have very early exposure to Indian retail trade uh, at a very young age. You know, our distributors and retailers are the most entrepreneurial, you know, most business-like people. So, and you spend the first three, four years, day in and day out, dealing with really hardcore entrepreneurs who are really sort of, you know, looking at very capital focused. I mean, entrepreneurs are fundamentally capital focused. You get a capital focused, rotation focused. So, so you come out of sales with a mindset on business, which is uh, highly sort of uh, entrepreneurial. I think these are the two reasons that, uh, and, and I think it is a self-reinforcing thing. I think culture is reinforcing. Uh, and once the culture sets up, see, there was also a period, and I must go back to Unilever itself was a unique multinational. Most multinationals, uh, even today, have a command and control operation. You know, they have headquarters somewhere, and then things radiate from that. In the early 1950s, we had a chairman of Unilever called Hayworth, who wanted to do something called ization. He said that Unilever will only grow when the far corners of the world, we have local management. So India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, it's not just India. Uh, very early on, it was one of the few first multinationals to have Indian CEOs. So in the early 60s, uh, we had PL Tandon, who was an Indian. So this sort of uh, giving freedom to the uh, operating units uh, at an early stage in, has also sort of started this uh, self-reinforcing entrepreneurship. Got it. And you speak about the early exposure to trade and sort of coming from a professional background, being reinforced by the processes in the company, but exposed to entrepreneurship. But in the way business is run or the way reviews are done, are there reinforcing mechanisms uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you give me a sense of how this gets built uh, at the start, but give me a sense of how this gets reinforced as you grow. Is there something about the way you conduct business or the yeah. way you conduct meetings or reviews, yeah. which reinforces this entrepreneurial professionalism. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things about entrepreneurial professionalism is, if you ask people within Unilever, they won't call us entrepreneurial. They, 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 but when you ask CEOs outside, they call us entrepreneurial. When you look at the company at a distance, uh, you find it entrepreneurial. And I'll give you an example, which I found was a, a great example that someone gave me of entrepreneurship. And, uh, and, and then we'll, I'll answer your question after that. There was, there was a guy called V. Kasturi Rangan, who in the 1980s, he's an IMA graduate, he built the personal products business of Levers. And several people I spoke to said he was so passionate about building sachets and shampoos that he would carry sachets and shampoos in his coat or in the back of his uh, car. And if he saw an outlet when he was going with the sales guys that didn't have a shampoo sachet, he would firstly sort of, you know, give hell to the sales manager, but take it off his coat and go and hang it there himself. Now, you know, this is the kind of uh, reinforcement of, and, 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 and what I've also realized in the company is that the stories that the company, and I guess that's the answer to your question, because I don't think there are any processes that encourage entrepreneurship. But, and I think there are processes that encourage professionalism, but there are stories that encourage entrepreneurship. That's a great insight. So, you know, all the conversations that you have and lever people sit together and drink will be about these mavericks uh, and how they entrepreneurially built this company at various points in time. And I, I think that's the combination of the stories and process which, uh, and I, I think that's what uh, builds it. Got it. Going back to one of the things you said, Sudhir, I wanted to pick up on it, uh, this notion of potential. Uh, uh, you said something interesting. You said for the first 10, 12 years, it's not that people don't notice. You're still marked for potential, but you possibly aren't, uh, there isn't, uh, let's say, enough maybe s celebration or uh, applauding going on. So I'm curious about that, but just, uh, Maybe a related question is, uh, in the book you talk about judgment, influence, and drive yeah. being the three markers of potential. Yeah. But what I found interesting was you go on to say that uh, for the first few years, yeah. it's it's drive, yeah. which is sort of the 
key axis of growth or differentiation, yeah. and then it moves to influence, and eventually it's judgment. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about uh, this notion of how potential plays out in Unilever, and I'm curious about these inflection points where sort of the needle moves from drive to influence yeah. to uh, yeah. to judgment. Yeah. You know, I spoke about, I wrote about judgment drive and influence in the context of recruiting people. Because if you recruit for the immediate job at junior management in industry, right, and it's different from professional services, and there's a very vast difference between professional services and industry. In industry, at, ju at junior levels, you need drive. But if you recruit the best person for the job, you're not recruiting for the future. Mm -hmm. So when we recruit management trainees, we have to recruit for junior management, middle management, and senior management. We expect every manager of ours. So at a very early age, we've got to see whether this guy's got the potential uh, to have judgment. Uh, does she have the potential to be influential? Though in the first five years, all that's going to determine success. And one of the reasons also we don't judge too early is that all that the first uh, seven, eight years tells you beyond a point is, or heavily over indexes in the fact of how driven you are. And it's you know only over a period of time that you start working as a team, and that's really where influence comes. And even after that, where you got to start making a decision. It's one of the reasons why we don't promote too early. Because if you promote too early, you're promoting on drive, mm -hmm. uh, and you're not promote. And, and and then you know you, a person will hit a barrier very fast and may not have either influencing or uh, judgment skills. So. I think that's the important thing on, uh, on on judgment drive and influence. I think there are natural inflection points for these uh, within HULDJ. I think the first eight, nine years, uh, you know, we call it work level two, which is kind of where uh, people are really sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of, it's, it's, a, it's heavily, you know, driven. And as you go a little bit more and more senior, you get some influence and judgment. I guess, you know, in middle management, what we call work level three, which is gently 10 to 15, 17 years, is where you uh, sort of have to work together as an organization with various functions and other people and get work done. And I guess at senior management, really the success or failure depends on, you know, do you get seven out of 10 decisions? I used to have a boss who said that anybody who gets nine or 10 out of 10 decision makers is a bad decision maker. Not taking enough risk. A good decision maker has to get seven. He has to get the right seven, uh, but you know, that, that's the right ratio. Five is too low, nine is too high. Mm. So nine to five being too too safe is that the point? I think it's that? too safe. Uh, you you are then you're analyzing too much. Uh, you're sort of you're not you're not quick enough on the decision. There is a speed factor to it. Interesting. You got to make those seven have to be the important decisions. You got to let go three relatively uh, low important decisions. So there's a decision making in taking decisions itself. You know in that sense. Meta. Yeah. But a uh, couple of questions. One is, uh, how do you? What are the markers you look for? I mean, given that you're uh, recruiting for judgment, influence, and drive, yeah. give us a sense of uh, how do you pick them up? How do yeah. you suss them out yeah. Yeah. early on? Number one, even before, even at a recruiting stage, for example, yeah. number one, and number two, how do you think about the leadership development mix yeah. when you're solving for each of these three variables? Not that it's sort of one at a time, but yeah. I'm curious how how that shifts as the axis of growth shifts. Yeah. See, one of the big determinants of drive actually is uh, excellence in your educational or co-curricular activity. It doesn't actually determine judgment in Indian circumstances, but it certainly determines uh, uh, drive that you know, and academic is an important part of it, but exceptional performance anywhere is a tick mark on drive for us. I think when we do the leave away of uh, recruitment, uh, we still are one of the old fashioned companies that do group discussions and uh, people think that group discussions are a problem solving forum. They're not a problem solving forum, they're a teamwork forum. So what we judge in, uh, in group discussions is not whether you're the guy who cracked the case, but are you the guy who facilitated someone else to crack the case? You know, how, how is the team dynamic? And that's what we're looking for. I guess in, in, in judgment is what we uh, look in the personal interviews. We generally tend to ask uh, questions regarding decisions uh, that a person has made in life and how they think through decisions. How intuitive are they? How analytical are they? So that's what we do. But there's a fourth thing, uh, Deepak, which is even more important. You know, one of our former Unilever chairman, I found in our annual reports, it said that you got to recruit for character and caliber. Uh, and between the two, character is far more important than caliber. So judgment drive and influence are determines of caliber, but there is a more important uh, variable, which is character, which we actually have a fourth interview where senior people interview. So ours is a four-step recruitment process where CV, uh, group discussion, interview one and interview two, which people say, why do you have such a long process? It's to judge, and the final one, we have senior people to see whether the person's got a character and high integrity which for us is actually the most important. Uh, uh, and how do you, uh, maybe just persisting with the theme, 
And for somebody, let's say, who's a student, um, how do you suss that out? I think, you know, authenticity and willing to share vulnerability in an interview, willing to sort of look deep and say, see, what do we mean by integrity? We're not judging whether a person is going to cheat the expense statement, right? The question that we're judging is, is a person true to themselves? When they make a mistake, are they able to kind of reflect and say it was their mistake rather than externalize? That's integrity at the end of the day. So what we look for is people who are a little bit uh, thoughtful about themselves, who who have a good you know idea of what's, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And so, you know, so that, that's really how at least I suss out uh, sort of the integrity of a person. And that's what I mean by integrity. No, this reminds me, uh, reminds me of uh, my previous firm, Egon Zender, when we, you, would, uh, you would do your 20, 30 rounds with colleagues around the world, then the man himself would meet you in his office in Zurich. And that chat would be about just anything, right? About opera, about you know, the world uh, climate and whatever. So I guess in a way, uh, I like the way you frame it as caliber versus character. By that time, the... I, I, the... I didn't frame it. So a former Unilever chairman framed it. Okay. But I caught on to the framing. Got it. Got it. <laughs> um, now, just uh, coming back to the sort of the bread and butter, uh, let's say, uh, themes for which HUL is known for uh, say, uh, marketing. Uh, and I'm in the context of the work I do, I'm curious about how that plays out uh, with individuals yeah. and personal brands. Yeah. Uh, give us a sense of uh, how some of the principles around marketing and branding yeah. uh, can be applied to leaders as, as leaders go about their respective journeys. And, yeah. and as an observer yeah. of, of the world around you, what are some of the, uh, let's say, uh, I won't say funny things, but what are some of the uh, inefficiencies you see in the way sometimes uh, people think about personal brands? Yeah. So, uh, DJ, I haven't actually, to be honest, thought deeply about personal brands, right? It's not an area that I have. Uh, but let me tell you about brands and let, let, let's see if there are some parallels between brands and personal brands. One of the things that great brands have uh, is that people who love the brand and people who hate the brand must say the same thing about it. That is the mark of a true uh, outstanding brand. So you may not like the things that people who like it, people who hate it may not like the same things, but they say the same thing. So a brand, as I've written in the book is... Give me an example here, sorry, just, just for me to get a sense of what you're saying. So, you know, let's say, uh, uh, let's take a strong brand that I worked on, let's say Lifebuoy. People who love it will say it's got the strong smell, which is really sort of... Uh, disinfectant and you know, I love it. It makes me feel really clean and hygienic. And guys who hate it will say, it's the strong smell and it's disinfectant. And I, you know, I really feel like I'm in a hospital. They'll align on the attribute. They will align on the attribute. So they will say the same things uh, about it, but they may like it or they may not like it, right? So that's the characteristic of, uh, of really, really powerful. It's a good way to judge uh, brands. And I suspect that's the same about personal brands as well. You cannot be, different things to different people. That's the principle of branding. You have to be the same thing to everybody, whether they like you or not. And therefore, you know, you got to choose those few attributes or those few associations you want to own. Close your eyes, whether it's a personal brand or a real brand, you'll be able to identify people in three, four words. Uh, then they're strong brands. They have to be authentic. Uh, they have to be true also to their, you know, one of the things I do a lot when I do brand work, uh, DJ, is we do something called brand archaeology, which is go into the deep history, and many of our brands are very old, the deep history of the brand, the founder, and what was the vision with which it was founded, and what was that sort of birthing qualities of the brand? Because they tend to be the true qualities of a brand that, you know, 70, 80, 100 years later, and you've got to kind of uh, rediscover it. Uh, and I think that's the truth about personal brands. I'm not an expert, as I tell you, but as I'm talking about it, I guess you've just got to go within. Uh, you can't game it and say, what will that person like and what will this person like and how can I be? You've got to understand what it is that you are. And whatever it is that you are, if you are true to it, people end up liking you. I mean, so, you know, uh, the, you know that, that, I think that, and that's true about brands. You know, the sharper they are, uh, you'll always have people respecting you. They may not choose you or, you know, they may choose something else. But uh, I guess those are the uh, parallels. But I love the, but I love the point around archaeology. Yeah, it's a cumulative and not an incremental. That's right. It's uh, you can't sort of ignore the past. That's right. And sort of uh, that's right. Create a de novo. Um, but you know, one of the things I think is true about personal brands and real brands is, and it's one of those paradoxes, which is, you know, levers and marketing are ordinary consumer obsessed, but ultimately brands have to turn inward. Mm -hmm. They have to be what they are, mm -hmm. and then they have to attract a set of consumers towards them. So I guess that's the same about uh, if, if you're gaming who you're talking to all the time in your mind, how do I be to this person, how do I be to that person, rather than focusing on what you are, 
you will end up being a weak brand. That's a great point. I mean, back to the character interview, yeah. that brings it back to authenticity. Yeah. If I may yeah. sort of yeah. connect the dots. Yeah. Um, and picking up on a similar theme, uh, Sudhir, uh, you talk about uh, growing a category versus growing a brand. Yeah. And you frame it as a choice between uh, doing more versus doing better. Yeah. And uh, that's that's something I reflect on as well yeah. uh, in the context of journeys. There's always this choice between specialization and generalization. Yeah. And uh, maybe trying out adjacencies. Yeah. Give us a sense of how you think about this in the context of brands and maybe uh, yeah. reflect on it yeah. as you would apply it to journeys. Yeah, no, I think Deepak, in the book, uh, uh, I think there are two separate points and I'll sort of answer them separately because uh, the first point is, why is it easier to grow a category than to grow market share within a category? And, and the second point is, why should a brand do what it's doing better rather than doing newer things? There are two, two separate uh, related but separate questions. I think the first question is that an category growing represents an unsolved consumer problem. Gaining market share represents a problem that is already solved and you're trying to go and get a piece of the cake, right? So from a consumer point of view, you're, you're, you, it's always easier and better and sort of more profitable and in, in whichever way you look at it, solving an unsolved problem rather than someone solved the problem already and you're trying to solve 5% that problem 5% better. This is why it's generally easier and better to you know build categories and bake your own pie rather than take a piece of someone else's pie as a general rule of uh, principle. The second point is that within brands, it is always better for a brand to do what it does better rather than to do many things. And it goes back to the question on what brands are and the, what, what you know brands are fundamentally. Brands, if they're a set of associations, you've got three or four pieces of real estate in consumers' minds. And the consumers' minds is the most expensive place and difficult piece of real estate to get. Now, what your job is to deepen those associations and sort of really have them stronger. A new association, the cost of doing it is always much higher than the cost of deepening an association. So, and also when you get new associations in, you start weakening the older associations. Give us an example here. So, you know, I, I gave an example in a book. When I was a, a management trainee, I worked in the foods category. And... Uh, you know, for a brief while. And I saw that what sold in the market was basically Kisan tomato ketchup and Kisan mixed fruit jam. It was 80 to 90% of our business. 20 years later I came, or 18 years later I came as a director of the foods business. And when I looked at our foods business, it was still 90% of uh, tomato ketchup and mixed fruit jam. In that interim, we had launched many, many things as Kisan. We had launched Kisan soy juice, we had launched Kisan staples, we had launched Kisan health food drinks, etc., etc. But the fact is that in consumers' minds, Kisan was this fruits and vegetable brand, uh, and it wasn't anything else. And guess what? You know, less than 15% of Indians consume uh, Kisan. So the same amount of money had we spent deepening those associations and gone from 15 to 30, would have been a lot better off rather than trying to get new associations with Kisan. So there's always an unsolved problem in what you're doing well and to do more of it. Very rarely, like there might be a 10% chance that, you know, you're kind of hitting a wall. But nine out of 10 times, there's always more room uh, and it's always easier to win where you are rather than to sort of go wide. And, and, uh if you reflect, uh, reflect on that in the context of uh, your journey or professional choices, is there a parallel uh, in terms of how you think about that over time? I think, you know, quite early on, uh, uh, in probably in IMA itself, I kind of uh, sort of doubled in on the fact that marketing was something I was good at and something that I enjoyed. And I've kind of broadly, uh, despite a lot of distractions here and there, and you know, you know how things are, you can always get distracted. Uh, I like building consumer brands, I like doing advertising, I like sort of doing innovation. So I've kind of kept myself uh, focused on these areas. And I, with time I've also realized that, you know, I, I kind of enjoy it. And I've kind of stuck to that journey uh, rather than learning too many new tricks. But uh, if I may go back to that and persist, uh, what gave you that conviction? Uh, I remember back in 99 when a lot of us were running around like headless chicken saying, you know, we'll get into a bank or a consulting firm or something else that pays the big bucks. Yeah. You had extraordinary clarity that uh, this was it. Yeah. What, what gave you that conviction at that point? No, I think, you know, uh, I, I must say that my father, I was fortunate who was, you know, he, 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 he uh, you know, he was a generation into the corporate world. You know, he was an LNT, he had worked in banks. So he had a good sense of uh, the world after you join after 10 years, 20 years. So I think he was one of the few things he was very clear about was that I joined Levers. 
Uh, he also felt that I should do marketing. He knew me well. So he was actually one of those guys who never really, you know, I was never a good student throughout because he never, he didn't allow me to do tuitions. He never really wanted me to do one thing. But the, one of the few things he wanted me to do in life uh, was to join Levers. I think he, he had a high regard for the institution, but I think he also saw it. And I, I, I must say that uh, when I, as, at IMA, so I actually got into Levers before I joined IMA and I didn't take it, though my dad wanted me to join Levers. Oh, is that so? I didn't yeah, know so that. when I was in Xavier's, you know, they recruited management trainees. Oh, I didn't know that, okay. And uh, he wanted me to take it, but I said, no, I am, but he was still keen, you know, so he made, I did my summers in Levers. And I also, once I kind of, uh, I guess, so on the one axis, there was a push there, and then I guess Professor A.K. Jain's marketing one did create a pull. So I, I did get fascinated by, him and the clarity of thought and sort of the deep rigor, because a lot of people, you know, come in thinking, you know, marketing is fluff, but you know, AK Jain was anything but that. It was just, just because it's not numbers all the time, it doesn't mean you can't have depth of thinking. So I guess those were the two influences that really have kept me going in. And if I may persist further, what gave your father uh, that conviction that HUL was the right thing for you? What about HUL appealed to him? See, he had a belief that, uh, he was an old fashioned guy. So he had a belief that the first job a person does, he was an engineer, he was an IIT engineer, should either be in the shop floor or in the market. So it was an old fashioned view. And it's a 100% right view. These things don't go out of fashion. Uh, I don't think, uh, I can say it as many times, I don't think young people should work in air conditioned offices on Excel sheets for the first four or five years of their life. So he was very clear that, uh, that foundation of uh, being out in the sort of heat. Uh, uh, so it was a value system of his. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, moving to another marketing concept that you talk about in the book, uh, the four P's of marketing that yeah. we talk about. And you say that product is the sort of the most significant P of, yeah. the, of the four P's. Now I've been in professional services all my life. Yeah. So as I was reading it, I was just curious about how this plays out, not in a product context, but in a services context. Yeah. So for a minute, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, A, why do you say product is the most yeah. important P, yeah. uh, but but also reflect on how this sort of maybe transposes to yeah. a services world. Yeah. See, the, you know, firstly in, in Levers, the marketing is the is a central function. So you kind of see the entire spectrum of what the consumer value is. And one of the interesting things uh, is whatever function I was doing, I always felt that was the most important P. So when I was in sales, I thought, you know, Place or distribution is the most important P. Then when I went to sort of, you know, more operational marketing, I thought promotions were really important. Then I thought advertising was important. Then I thought pricing was important. And I kind of finally netted this out with lots of good and bad experiences, saying that if you get your product right, uh, the results will come. You, If you do other things right, they may come sooner. Uh, and if you don't do them right, they may come later. But if you do product wrong, it will never come. And if you do product right, you might have to be patient, but it will eventually come. And I've just had innumerable uh, cases seeing it. And I guess you need to have that clarity because if you focus too much on the other, so, so, so the other P's are enablers of bringing the product. They are not it in itself. Uh, and I guess the, the professional services uh, group that I worked most closely with is advertising agencies. So let me draw a parallel there because I worked a little bit with management consulting and HR, but this is something I work on a day-to-day -day basis. So the best advertising agencies are those that deliver the best advertising. They're not the ones that do the best strategy. They're not the ones who do the advertising networks on time. They're the ones who make advertising that people want to watch. Hmm. So, uh, and, and that's, and, and so when you evaluate an agency, you have to really look at the people who are creating the advertising and they're really the big value creators for you. Hmm. So I guess that's true about every uh, profession. And, and, and word spreads around fast. I mean, we call it word of mouth. But if the product is good, uh, somehow word gets around. So I, I, I don't know how you enough, draw enough. a conclusion into uh, your world, but... Uh, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, the, the other piece you talk about, which is often uh, uh, confused, uh, or people uh, mix it up, is this notion of core competence and competitive advantage. Yeah. And you talk about sales and branding and uh, a couple of other things in the context of HUL. Yeah. So give us an insight into uh, how, do you, how do you think about the distinction between these yeah. two and, and uh, talk to us about how these play out in a Unilever context. Yeah, well, it's an interesting story, you know, uh, as a management trainee, we are sent to ETA, which is a village uh, outside UP, uh, in UP, uh, into a village uh, where we stay for six weeks. 
Uh, we basically live with the farmer there and uh, eat his food. And on a fr a Saturday morning, we were allowed to come back to Eta town, where we had to stay in a guest house of a doctor, a local doctor. And the local doctor's son was a sort of uh, self-educated guy. You know, he was an uh, autodidact. He was not, uh, not an MBA like us. And he told me, he said, you know, you guys in Levers, I meet all of you. You guys keep telling me that your core competence is distribution. That's not your core competence. Your core competence is, uh, you know, understanding consumer needs and making products. Your competitive advantage is you go to more outlets, but someone can do it tomorrow better than you, can go to the same number of outlets. That doesn't mean you'll shut down. You know, you're ultimately, uh, he said, very interesting. He said, you guys are a chemical engineering firm and you've got to understand that's your core competence. Wow. So I found, so I think the interesting story is that this guy was uh, just not in the circuit that would sort of say that he was reading these kind of things all the time in his free time and running some small business there in ETA. Uh -huh. So, so uh, it stayed with me. I mean, uh, you got to ask that question all the time as to what's that fundamental uh, sort of uh, truth about a company without which it will fail. And I think in the case of Levers, it is understanding consumer needs and giving brands to solve those needs. That, that, that's the heart of uh, our gig. Uh, everything else again is an enabler. So, uh, you know, good supply chain, efficient costs, uh, good media, all of that, even good advertising, you know, but that, that's the heart of what we do, so. Got it, got it. Back to the discussion on people. Yeah. Uh, the other very uh, interesting and possibly borderline counterintuitive uh, insight was you talking about uh, Mavericks company men and rogues yeah. and uh, more specifically HUL's treatment of Mavericks yeah. and uh, you go on to say that sometimes companies get too harsh with these people yeah. and that's a lost opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about what you mean by these terms and uh, yeah. and more specifically uh, how HUL deals with some of these Mavericks. You know it's a bit like the entrepreneurship point uh, where it's common you know kind of gripe within the organization to say we're not entrepreneur enough and there's a common gripe within the organization and a lot of people repeat it saying this is a clone organization, everybody is the same. Uh, and that's how we kind of, that's the starting point, right? But when I actually started speaking to people uh, about HUL and people who've been, you know, joined in the 50s to now, a uh, lot of the conversation actually came up and people who were idealized were people who were mavericks. I mean, I gave you the example of V. Kasturangan, but there were several others like this. So, and, and they were able to associate those mavericks with, uh, distinct uh, periods of great success of the company and they were able to attribute it to, uh, to those people. So I think the interesting thing about HUL is that a lot of people look the same and speak the same language, but there is this uh, a group of people who aren't the same and uh, you know who are still allowed to flourish in the company and it's not that easy in a lot of multinationals uh, for that to happen and, and I was speaking to a consultant friend of mine and I was telling him, look, this is what I found. I found uh, a lot of the successes I'm able to attribute to people and people who have and did very well. They didn't go to the very top of HOL, I must tell you, uh, but they, they did pretty much near the top. Uh, and he said a lot of companies, it's fashionable to over-index on teamwork and you know, ultimately what's important is output. Teamwork's an input, right? So you can't, it's not an end in itself. So this sort of, uh, and, and again, I guess it's, it goes back, uh, DJ, to this collegial camaraderie uh, and this group of people who are there together in a sort of almost familial sense. So unless someone is, uh, lacks integrity and rogues, which the company has, again, traditionally had very strong value systems on, and they kind of get ejected, uh, there's a reasonable amount of tolerance for these, may not be great team players, but value creators and a lot of respect for them as well. So, uh, and I, I, I think that's a, I mean, as I spoke to people, I think that's a, it's a relatively unique secret sauce of HUL. It doesn't, it's not obvious because people look the same, the same educational background and so on, but you think about it, it's uh, it sort of ties in with the entrepreneur professional uh, argument. In fact, I think it is the secret sauce if I were to kind of- Very interesting. Uh, and maybe to make it real, Sudhir, what are the moments of truth and what are the kind of situations where you need to be patient or tolerant with Mavericks? What's the friction that you need to live with for Mavericks to flourish? The reason that HUL is able to tolerate and live with Mavericks for a long time, again, goes back to some of the HR processes. I think uh, there are strong uh, meritocratic uh, evaluation processes and a lot of the KPIs are quite output driven. Now, some, some organizations find it hard to have 
output driven KPIs by the very nature of what they do. I think one of the advantages in the business that we are in is at, at senior management again, one is so, you know, A, a we're able to, talk, since again, it goes back to some of the earlier points, which is since you give a lot of latitude for the first 10 years and you're not really evaluating people in the first 10 years, sort of Mavericks, you know, coast along. And that's really where Mavericks really have the most friction early on, right? Once they come to senior management where, where judgment starts to play a role, Mavericks tend to be good decision makers. So it allows the Mavericks to come to middle management or senior management and then flourish. I think it's got good output related KPIs where if you're bringing in the bacon, uh, there's a reasonable amount of uh, tolerance. So uh, I would say it's a combination of these two, but probably the first one. Hmm. Probably what, you know, one of my former uh, bosses, you know, he calls it, a, uh, I think he calls it a empathetic meritocracy, hmm. which is not a hard meritocracy. You know, if you have a hard meritocracy in like, you know, investment banks or whatever, as you are two years and then you're out, uh, you know, it won't have tolerance for Mavericks. Because hmm. early on when things can't get attributed, people who conform, get more attribution than those who don't conform. That's what happens early on, right? So the fact that you don't evaluate for 10 years or you don't hard evaluate and you're kind of supportive throughout, I think that's probably what uh, more, uh, when I think about it more than the sort of KPI thing, I think this is probably why, uh, it, it's like a family which allows the sort of black sheep of the family to still be in the, till suddenly, you know, like, you know, you discover a talent of that person. <laughs> And suddenly somewhere it flourishes, you know, so that, that's, uh, that's probably why. Got it. And just moving to culture, you spoke about culture in the context of uh, entrepreneurial uh, professionals. But uh, in the book, you also talk about the four pillars of culture, action, yeah. values, courage and yeah. truth. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, how these get uh, yeah. uh, reinforced. Yeah. Uh, in, on a daily basis. Yeah. No, I, you know, in the early 2000s, we were having a really bad time as a business and our CEO, chairman at that time, Vindi Banga, came to one of our annual conferences and said, guys, it's time to go back to our values. You know, they're action, caring, courage, and truth. Those were the four values, he said. And all of us had a rollicking time with that. So every time in the canteen, you know, we would keep making fun and it just sounded like jargon and you know, that's how it sounded. Uh, and maybe we could have phrased it better and sometimes there's something, but, you know, now when I was sort of one of the, I interviewed many, many people and I kind of, one of the techniques I do in market research is not ask people about the values, but ask them what their favorite memories about HUL, right? What are your stories that you remember, at, you know? And, and when I grouped those stories, I found quite uh, perplexingly, and I told Vindi this, and I also sort of admitted to him that I laughed, but a lot of those stories were uh, coming in the buckets of uh, action, which is the same entrepreneur professional thing, a uh, caring which kind of demonstrated itself mainly in terms of employees who are either ill or who pass away in the course of service. Courage which is standing up, uh, and again goes back to mavericks of standing up to power and speaking truth to power, and truth which is basic honesty. So these were the four uh, stories that came. So they, they, people didn't express them as values. I kind of synthesized back to something that I had, I had heard as a young manager. And when I think about some of these stories and, and why do these four values, right? Because values, you know, all companies have values, you know, Enron had written its values all over its offices. Right? It doesn't mean anything, right? It's just management jargon. So values are only values when people speak the call, even if they don't know, use the word action, caring, courage, and truth, they, they must kind of live those values. When I sort of reflected deeply on what is the cause of the values, actually a lot of these are uh, values of Unilever. Unilever itself is a unique company uh, which gave these values to HUL 70, 80 years ago and then, you know, values reinforced themselves. Uh, and Unilever's history itself is interesting because it had on the one hand an English company with uh, uh, William Lever who was a uh, 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 he was a really ruthless businessman, eccentric, and a, uh, and a serious philanthropist. And a philanthropist not just in giving money, but you know, he created this place called Port Sunlight where he was very involved in the well-being of their workers. You know, the Tatas and so on have been inspired by the Port Sunlight model of management. So the genetic code of levers has this uh, caring element and this action element coming from its uh, English heritage. And this so very Calvinistic uh, Dutch honesty uh, and truth to power was a Dutch uh, genetic strand that came in. So these are actually values that are pretty true to many of the Unilever companies. I, I would sort of in all humility say that uh, that's probably the uh, reason for HUL uh, having these values. But back to, uh, let's say, your reaction when Wendy Bangra spoke about those values. Yeah. 
Now, for a, minute, for a minute, if we assume that's typically the reaction of people when the, the leader speaks about values, how do you ensure that from a transmission, in your case, you happen to research for the book and you yeah. had the luxury of collecting stories and seeing them fit into these four buckets. Yeah. But uh, how do you ensure that as a leader, uh, when, you, when you're when you transmitting values, yeah. it's not it's not seen as jargon, yeah. but it's uh, people live it. Yeah. So I think there are two answers to it. The most superficial answer is it's a it's a kind of branding answer. I think action, courage, caring, and truth could have been better branded. For example, you know, in the in the organization that I run right now, which is Foods and Refreshments, we have four values, and you know, I call it rebellious integrity, which I think is a better way of understanding what integrity means. Integrity doesn't mean following the book; it means uh, sort of questioning the book all the time, but you know, always doing things which are in the interest of the business. So there is certainly in in value speak uh, because values have become so much jargon. There, you know, you, one must think a little bit about how one communicates it. But ultimately, DJ, I think that values should not be communicated. Values. Uh, it doesn't actually matter whether people know what the values of the company are and what those words are. They just have to live themselves uh, and you've got to see enough expressions of it all over the organization. Uh, and you've got to be clear as you know, senior management, what is it that the core values of this company that have made it great are? And you have to find enough uh, symbols or signs of it across. The, so you've got to find it. I, I think it's a mistake to say that, you know, do people repeat the values? That's not, doesn't mean anything, right? But do people live it even if they don't know uh, that those are the company values? And providing you are snooping around the organization enough to know that this is happening at periodic intervals or it's not happening and you're truthful about it, I suspect that's the better way to inculcate. But if I may persist, uh, how do you get deliberate about perpetuating the values? I hear you that just saying ABCD is not going to cut it. Yeah. That's not the way yeah. values get transmitted or even in a family context. Yeah. That's not the way kids pick up your values. Yeah. But how do you get deliberate as a leadership team yeah, yeah. to perpetuate these values? I think there are only two things, uh, DJ. One is uh, recruitment, both into the company and to the teams that you are in. So you must be clear that you must recruit people with the values and character that you are really looking for. And two is you have to live it. I mean, if you live it and your uh, senior teams live it, then everybody sees it. If you don't, so if you don't find enough evidence of it in the organization, you're not living it. You're not uh, doing enough. You might be talking about it, you're not doing enough about it. Got it. But I was just wondering, back to our discussion before we started this conversation around stories, yeah. if there was sort of a, uh, a structured uh, approach to, tr one is sort of living it, of course, yeah. that's hygiene. Yeah. But in the way that gets percolated through the organization, I was wondering if there was a, if there was a systematic approach there. See, I don't know if there's a systematic approach to storytelling, but I think shared tough experiences are generally good cauldrons in which stories emerge. Hmm. So uh, if you're able that, you can structurally do something about it. If you have people sharing difficult uh, physical experiences or uh, you know periods of time, etc., hmm. you know rural stints uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, those tend to, uh, call, you know, get camaraderie comes in, people open up, stories come up. So that is something you can... So one of the things that I personally like to do a lot of uh, with my teams is to push them to go to markets and consumers all the time. Mm -hmm. I think when you're outward facing and have those kind of experiences, go somewhere deep in, meet some consumer somewhere. Uh, those are the kind of, you know, go with two brand managers, go and they sit and they talk, or you go to the sales guy. There was a really nice story that uh, MK Sharma, who was our former vice chairman and chairman of ICSCI, gave me in the book, which is in those days, we don't have it now. You know, he, he wrote a, a long story about how an excellent piece of legal work he had done, and he had cracked some case in Jabalpur, and when he came, uh, he found a letter, which was a reprimand letter, which is, he said, the only reprimand letter I got in my life. And it said that you went to Jabalpur, but you didn't go and have dinner at the house of the salesman there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, you know, that, that is the, uh, we don't have that tradition anymore, but he sort of made that point saying that, uh, it's my only reprimand in my entire, uh, and reprimand is a pretty serious thing, and it was done after doing a really great piece of work. Uh, sorry. Uh, Lovely, Sudhir. Uh, uh, just as somebody who researched HUL extensively as, as a part of writing the book, if I may ask, uh, what are the two, three things that came as a surprise to you? If, yeah. you, if I mean, of course, there's the HUL that you've sort of yeah. li lived over the last uh, two decades. Yeah. And then there's the HUL that you've discovered through the research. Yeah. What, uh, what would you say are the two, three things you didn't appreciate enough when you started out writing this book? I think the uh, thing which at depth that I understood was this entrepreneurship and maverickness about the genetic uh, makeup of this company, which is not obvious uh, when you're in the coalface. 
because you think you only see the process, but you don't see the entrepreneurship uh, that a large company like this allows at various points in time. It doesn't allow wanton entrepreneurship, that's also true. That has certainly been uh, 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 some, something which is new to me. So if you tell people, What's the first thing that you think about levers? They're not going to say entrepreneurship, right? But the fact is you don't survive uh, doing extremely well for 60 years if you don't have entrepreneurship. So, so that, that's... The other thing that sort of surprised me was the uh, passion for the companies uh, uh, that people who have long retired or have left the company and are CEOs, they still call it our company. Uh, and uh, the remarkable similarity in the stories that they would narrate with respect to the values of the company. So the other thing which is almost nobody in HUL will know what the official values of the company are, but I have a suspicion that a lot of people live it and, and you see it when you kind of go outside. These are the two things that's about it. So the pleasure talking to you. Thanks, DJ. Thanks so much for making the time and Thanks, uh, good luck with the success of the book. Thank you. All right. Thanks.